And Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, that no prophet is accepted in his own country. Luke 4, verse 24. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus asks, When I come back, will I still find faith on earth? Since 2000 AD, 14 million Catholics have left the faith. The Center for Applied Research into the Apostolate based in Washington, D.C. also released the following data. Noticeable is the marked percentage decline on the following. Parish religious education for children by 24%. Catholic school attendance by 19%. Infant baptism by 28%. Adult baptism by 31%, and sacramental Catholic marriages by 41%. With this information in mind, I ask again, how many of us will still have faith in God before Christ will come again? The prospect is not only dim, but also frightening. There is a clarion call for all of us Catholics who still have the faith to take our place without hesitation in the spiritual battle that is raging around us. In Ezekiel 22.30, we read, And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land. This battle is wounding the children the youth and families, it is distorting the dignity of women and men. Bishop Thomas Olmsted of Phoenix, Arizona boldly stated in his 2016 apostolic letter published by In the Breach. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 14, it says that the word and the church is under attack. The battle is often hidden, but it is real. The era of Russia, also known as the culture of death, and the Marxist liberation theology have spread throughout the world. More than ever, we need today men of faith who are confident and fearless to proclaim with boldness what we believe in Jesus Christ to Mary and the Holy Father's magisterium for humanity's salvation. But what is this faith that we must fearlessly proclaim? The Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1814, defines faith as the theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that He had said and revealed to us and that Holy Mother, the Church, proposes for our belief because He is the truth. In today's reading, Jesus officially announced His mission as the Messiah, the Savior and Liberator. But who believe Him? Definitely not His fellow countrymen. Their first reaction was one of amazement that Jesus, their own townsman, could speak with such power and authority. Why did He get all this? They sneered at Him. There was amazement but no real faith in Him. Familiarity had blinded them to Jesus' true identity. Basically, they rejected Him. For them, He's just Jesus, the son of the carpenter, Joseph. However, Jesus was not surprised by this reception. No prophet is ever accepted in his own country, He told them. Jesus also mentioned to his incredulous listeners two well-known Old Testament prophets who were not received by their own people and because of this reached out to non-believers. First was Elijah. During the great famine among the Israelites, it was a Sidonian widow whom Elijah helped, not the Israelites. 
because of the woman's openness and charity to the prophet. Second was Elisha. Again, during the great plague that visited Israel, many were affected with leprosy, but only Naaman, the Syrian, a Gentile, was cured by Elisha because Naaman was open and docile. On hearing these examples from Jesus, his listeners took his story as arrogant and insulting and threatened to throw Jesus off the cliff because in their minds, they were not rejecting a prophet, but an imposter. Catechism 1814 states, By faith, man freely commits his entire self to God. For this reason, the believer seeks to know and do God's will. The righteous shall live by faith, and living faith works true charity. We do not need to look to the distant past to find the great heroes of our faith. Remember John Paul II, who was shot three times by Ali Adka? The world was shocked when he forgave his would-be assassin. The Pope's health was then affected badly. Later, in 1987, he also contracted Parkinson's disease. It was only of natural recourse that in 1989, John Paul II was urged by then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger to resign from the papacy if he felt he could no longer lead the church capably towards the heavenly kingdom. A copy of the Pope's 1989 letter reads that he would resign if, and in the case of infirmity which is presumed incurable, long-lasting, and which would impede him from sufficiently carrying out the function of his apostolic ministry. But this great Pope, nevertheless, continued on tirelessly amid shaking hands, deformed speech, hampered knees and hands, until his last days to carry his responsibilities, even when he could only utter voiceless speeches. In these moments, the shout of the people around him was like the temptation brought forward by the chief priests and Pharisees to Jesus, Get down from the cross if you are the Son of God. If the Pope were only thinking of himself and his comfort, it would have been easier to come down from the cross and enjoy his retirement days in solitude. But no! John Paul II, the greatest pope of our times, surrounded by reverberating insinuations from cardinals in the Curia asking him to resign, did not come down from the cross. He stayed on and held on strong. I remember asking then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger during a meeting of our family movement at his office at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith about John Paul II's health. The cardinal told me, the Pope is very tough. His faith in Jesus, who made him vicar, is unshakable. Even with his Parkinson's disease getting worse every day, the Pope carries a full hectic schedule daily in serving the church, heavier than the strongest cardinal in the Roman Curia could handle. Pope John Paul II did not come down from the cross because he loved Jesus Christ and his neighbor as he loved himself. He wanted to witness to the whole world the power of the cross amidst his weakness. The Pope, the saint's life, merely confirms what 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10 proclaims, When I am weak, I am strong in Christ who strengthens me. He relentlessly called the word to open wide the doors to Christ. In 1995, before the biggest crowd ever to gather in the history of a papal visit, Pope John Paul II told the six million young people in Manila, Philippines, be not afraid. Until the last day of this Pope's life, he did not come down from the cross. His faith stood firm in the promises of Christ. If God anointed 
Pope John Paul II to become his instruments of love. As vicar of Christ, God also gave him the capacity to handle and deflect all the attacks from the enemy, the devil, against the church and him with love, fortitude, and prudence. Few hours before his death, he was still lucid, professing his faith and loyalty to Christ, and wanted to talk to the thousands of people doing vigil outside of St. Peter's Square, who stood watch for him. When the Pope's secretary, then Archbishop Stanislaw Jewitz, wheeled him to the balcony window to talk to the people, there was only mute silence. No audible sound came from the Pope's mouth. It was, however, the most powerful speech Pope John Paul II ever delivered in his life. That very moment, everyone looked up to the great leader of the Catholic faith, who, as he grappled for words, uttered all that was in his heart. This was the silent speech that transfixed the hearts of all men who stood watch to see the witness of a true man of faith, broken maybe in the body, but powerfully vibrant and strong in spirit. It was a witness of faith of the true pastor of the church, who in his last silent breath told his flock, Be not afraid, for death has been conquered by sacrifice spelled as love. He stood there confirming his promise to all that he would continue to be their good shepherd who would protect them from the wolves. Benedict XVI cried as he was greatly moved by this gesture of faith and love from Pope John Paul II. He said, he is the greatest Pope this world ever had. Since then, he initiated calling him John Paul II the Great. Catechism 1815 states that the gift of faith remains in one who has not sinned against it. But faith, apart from work, is dead. When it is deprived of hope and love, faith does not fully unite the believer to Christ and does not make him a living member of his body. Today, in many parts of the world where persecution continues to rage, we are seeing courageous witnesses of truth. In the recent martyrs of Syria, Nigeria, Iraq, India, Indonesia, China, North Korea, and other war-torn countries. We remember three years ago in 2015, 21 of our Coptic brothers were beheaded on the beach in Egypt only because they confess Christ. Friends, we must never believe that holiness and courage are things of the past. You and I are called today to a holiness that shows Christ to the world as our forefathers have done countless times throughout history, following the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, in this day and age where the smoke of evil has practically entered all passages of human existence with ever-growing boldness, each one of us must prepare for nothing less than martyrdom in whatever form this may take and to instill in our children and grandchildren the willingness to do the same. The story of an 11-year-old Turkish Christian named Hussein who was bullied and threatened just for wearing a cross necklace to school. He had a, a little cross necklace, he went to school yeah. and he was bullied yeah. at school and even from the teacher. It's not the physical cross, it's the meaning of the cross that's important. It's a beautiful thing. I wanted people to ask me about it, and then I could tell them about Christ. Christ said you would suffer for me. It's okay to suffer for Christ, and we should be happy to suffer for Christ. The Lord Amen. is with me. Therefore, put on the armor of God, that you may be able to resist on the day of evil, and having done everything to hold your ground, 
For as Jesus said, I am sending you as lambs before the wolves. But fear not, I have overcome the world. In Ephesians 6, 11 to 17, we continue to read, So stand fast with your loins girded in truth, clothed with righteousness as a breastplate, and your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, hold faith as a shield to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Catechism of the Catholic Church 1816 teaches that the disciple of Christ must not only keep the faith and live on it, but also profess it, confidently bear witness to it, and spread it. All, however, must be prepared to confess Christ before man and to follow Him along the way of the cross, amidst the persecutions which the church never lacks. Service of and witness to the faith are necessary for salvation. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. The young Italian saint, Blessed Pier Giorgio Prasati, declared to his friends, To live without faith, without a patrimony to defend, without a steady struggle for truth, that is not living, but existing. St. Augustine, for his part, left us this wisdom. Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Let us pray. O loving God, when you come back again in glory, you ask us, would there still be faith on earth? As we go around consecrating families to your most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of the Blessed Mother, in every country around the world, we see the same painful scenario replicated in many homes, faithlessness, atheism, an increase in diabolical activities, especially among the young. But nevertheless, we completely trust in your merciful love to help us increase in our faith daily, so that when the hour of reckoning comes, we may remain standing at the gateway, wide awake, with a lampstand alit, waiting in faith for your coming. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.